Welcome to another event in our ongoing community conversation here in New York's capital region. The time for reckoning, confronting systemic racism, seeking justice, and reimagining society. This project is brought to you by the Center for Law and Justice, the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany, public television station WMHT, the Justice Center of Rensselaer County, and the Times Union. The Time for Reckoning brings you perspectives of local leaders and affected community members, as well as city officials and nationally known experts. For interactive community forums and a wide range of timely events, please visit our website, timeforreckoning.org. You can find a link here on your screen. I'm Mark Koplick, Assistant Director of the Writers Institute. We're thrilled to be here today with Mindy and Robert Fullulove, civil rights activists and leading scholars on the subjects of the built environment, the physical city, and its relationship to mental and physical health, particularly in minority communities. We're fortunate to have them with us because any proper discussion of structural racism needs to consider the physical structures that define our lives, the buildings and the thoroughfares, the main streets and public squares. Mindy discusses all that in her wonderful new book, Main Street, and we'll be focusing on that in a moment. I'd like to welcome Dr. Alice Green, founder and executive director uh, of the Center for Law and Justice. Alice is also the leader of the team behind this extraordinary symposium. If any one person can be the embodiment of the capital region's own Main Street, it's Alice. She serves as a human bridge and meeting place between the halls of power and the most marginalized citizens from the ivory towers of the universities to the elementary schools of inner city neighborhoods, from the historic free black farming communities of the Adirondacks to the incarcerated populations of upstate New York prisons. It's a pleasure for all of us to work with her. Thanks for being here, Alice. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. Robert Fullerlove is Associate Dean for Community and Minority Affairs and Professor of Clinical Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia University's Mailman School of Public Health, where he's also co-director of the degree program in Urbanism and the Built Environment. Of local interest, he serves as Senior Advisor to the Bard College Prison Initiatives Public Health Program and has been teaching public health courses in six New York State prisons. Dr. Mindy Thompson Fullerlove, MD, is an American social psychiatrist who focuses on the ways environmental factors affect the mental health of communities. She's professor of urban policy and health at the New School in New York City and author of a contemporary classic about the psychology of place, Root Shock, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America, and what we can do about it. <clears throat> She's also the author of a new landmark work, Main Street, How a City's Heart Connects Us All. It's a valuable and pioneering book that addresses the integral role that main streets play in the health and vibrancy of cities and the interactions of their inhabitants across racial and socioeconomic divides. We recommend Main Street to all our viewers among other things, it's a beautifully written and poetic book. You can find a link to purchase it at the Book House of Stuyvesant Plaza here on this screen. Mindy and Robert, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Mindy, um, your book is based on 11 years of field research in 178 cities. One of the cities on your long list happens to be Albany, New York. Is there anything striking about Albany that you'd like to talk about? Uh, well, you know, it was a, it was a real privilege because I got to visit Albany both with Robert Miller, who's a professor at SUNY Albany in social work. And, uh, you know, I worked with him as a doctoral student when he was at Columbia University. So that was a great thrill. And then also, um, I'm connected to people through Miriam Axelud, who's uh, editor of Social Shelter Force, sorry. And so Miriam and some community groups took me around. So I got to see a great deal of the city from those two perspectives. 
Um, and it was a very special day. Uh, among other things, they pointed out the long stare and I got to read a murder mystery about the long stare. So it was, it was great. You know, the, the main thing about Albany is that it's, it's a great American city. And like all great American cities, it's been roughed up. Um, but it, it retains its, its heart, its liveliness, uh, its good people. So I just love visiting Albany. So, um, Robert, did, did you join Mindy on all of this field work in 178 cities? And, and what was that like? Uh, I was definitely present for all the work that was done in France. And I was definitely present for some of the stuff that happened in the U.S. So if everybody's wondering about our relationship, Mindy and I were married for a considerable period of time. We're no longer married, but uh, Mindy still directs the efforts of the Cities Research Group, as well as the University of Orange. And I consider myself one of their prime allies. I'm also someone because uh, I am absolutely adoring of France and the French language. I have maintained contact with one of our most important colleagues over there, Michel Cantal Dubois. And every year that I'm in France, I always wind up traveling with him. In some respects, revisiting some of the places and projects that Mindy and I were with him to sort of see. And in others, I'm often carrying messages back and forth because the work we do in the US is often heavily influenced by the ways in which Cantal has given us kind of a unique way to look at what's going on. But a lot of the stuff that's in, uh, in Main Street, no, I, I had to read about it for the first time. And I too uh, am so enthralled with it that uh, I'm planning to teach it in one of the courses that I will be, uh, that I'm engaged with currently, actually at Columbia at this moment. I start teaching it in October, I can't wait. Great. Alice, um, how have you seen uh, Albany and its sister cities transform? And has it gotten better or worse for urban minority neighborhoods? Yeah, I, this, um, the book uh, certainly has caused me to think about these main streets that I've been a part of for so long. <laughs> uh, and they're identified in a certain way and people react to them by whatever that uh, identification is. For instance, uh, you talk about Central Avenue, um, which is one of the main streets in Albany. And we've always, uh, in the past, we thought of it as a place of business. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, in the middle of a, one of the um, uh, areas, low-income areas, where people really never thought of uh, that being a place for them. <laughs> but it's changed over the past few years. Uh, Central Avenue has drawn more um, immig uh, immigrant groups there to open businesses. And uh, even a number of, of African Americans have their business there now. So the street, you know, has changed dramatically. But what uh, concerns me is that no matter how these streets have changed, and we can look at, at Broadway and some of the others, is that the stigma lingers uh, about those streets. And many people in the community uh, see them as not a place to um, have any kind of connection to, unfortunately. So I was just wondering if, um, uh, you know, in, according to the book, uh, where we're talking about uh, main streets being able to, you know, become more uh, vibrant and, and help people become more involved with each other. Um, I'm wondering if that's happening in Albany, because as I look at, the, at those main streets, uh, even Broadway now has become uh, a place for millennia, millennia, um, uh, middle class, white, with their open their businesses, and it's not seen as an area for blacks to, in, you know, to be involved with. Uh, Pearl Street itself is changing, and that's the most... Uh, uh, a recognizable street probably in, in, in Albany. Um, but it's, there's just recently um, been approval by the Common Council to open that 787 so that the community might have access to uh, the, the river. But still, uh, we didn't see anything like that happening when they opened up the other access further down on Pearl Street. 
So I'm trying to get a better sense of how um, these streets, even though the you know, housing has changed and we've drawn some people from the suburbs into the city, um, how can they change to make that kind of connection that we're concerned about? They might be vibrant, but the, the stigma lingers. And since I'm in criminal justice, I'm always you know, dealing with issues around um, uh, low-income communities, where the violence is, where the crime is, and uh, it, it's, it lingers, that stigma lingers. So I'm just very curious to, to talk about uh, how do we deal with that and, and make the kind of connections that I think uh, uh, we're talking about? Great question. In uh, a project that our research team worked on called City Life is Moving Bodies, the CLIMB project, we were interested in some uh, parks in northern Manhattan, a, a set of cliffside parks. So they were in the minority neighborhoods of Harlem and Washington Heights. And they had been pretty much abandoned by the Parks Department. So especially um, Highbridge Park, but to some extent also all of these cliffside parks had become fearsome to the community. And, and they, uh, so the issue of how do you help a park become a place of welcome for all the people? We didn't want to drive out the homeless people or the drug users who had found a place in that park, but we did think it should be, everybody should, feel because it's beautiful parks. Everybody should feel free to go there. So our colleague Lourdes Rodriguez uh, invented a method she called walking meetings. And she basically took all the community leaders and politicians and school children into the park so they could see the beauty and they could walk through. And they could also see that it was in shambles. And this led to a real change of heart. It really helped to lift the stigma. She called it an exorcism that she had to exercise the, the, the sense that this was a, a devilish place um, and, and help people see the beauty, help people see that some money could really make it useful to everybody. And now there's been about $150 million invested in that string of parks, which makes it a whole different place. But it, it's the two together. It, it's, you have to take people there and help them enjoy it. So the idea of the People's Joy Parade on Cherokee Street, which I write about in my book, takes people to Cherokee Street and they have a great time and then they want to go back to Cherokee Street. So I think you have to take people by the hand when you're dealing with these kinds of spatial signals. And I'd like to add something from earlier work that we did in Pittsburgh way back in the 1990s. Mindy became really impressed with how much, and this comes from our colleagues in France, people don't actually pay attention to the places where they live. So and Pittsburgh, which had suffered a wave of urban renewal, which Mindy writes about in her book, Root Shock, it became sort of clear that uh, folk wanted to do something that was about revitalizing the community. They were concerned with yet another round of federal initiatives that would take care of whatever public housing was there. And the question of how to mobilize people to have a really different sense of what was going on in their hometown was one that was on everybody's mind. But part of what we learned from the French is that people can walk to places for a considerable period of time without actually paying attention to what's there. So Mindy said, look, part of the way you can assess the health of a community, the health of a place like Main Street in Albany, a Main Street in Albany, is to look at the structure of disinvestment and investment. To look at how many buildings that used to be there that are now abandoned and derelict and have people sort of take a sense of what was it like before and what is it like now. So with maps of Pittsburgh and the Hill District in the 1950s, and then in 1998, walking residents of that town, where they're looking at their neighborhood, that's what's really clear, they're not outsiders, they're looking at their neighborhood, but they're seeing it in a different light. They're looking at its history, and they're looking at what happened 40 years later. It was quite a revelation. And the notion that part of what you were doing was determining using something from medicine, a burn index, how much of the living tissue of the, city, of the city is still here and how much, how much of it has been destroyed, how much of it has been subject to disinvestment, how much of it has just disappeared. Getting people to have conversations about where things are with respect to where things were many years ago 
is often a way in which you get people interested in and connected to things that they've started to take advantage of, that they've started to take for granted, excuse me, because they're no longer looking. They're no longer seeing. They're no longer engaged in the places where they live in quite the same way. Everything about having people walk around and look at their homes in a different light is one of the ways in which I think you help people re-see and rethink all the possibilities that are present, all the possibilities that might be encouraged to increase. The people simply knew that they were there, thought about their development, and then committed themselves to do something to make things better. And I think in a, in a lot of ways, helping people, not through written material, but helping them experientially to experience what's going on in a place that they may have known for a long time, but they're no longer paying attention to, is something that I think a lot of people who do community organizing would like to like to consider. It's, it's quite an effective method. Yeah, that makes me think about what Underground Railroad uh, in Albany has been doing. They had the, the history walks, uh, but focused on, uh, you know, uh, the period of enslavement, for instance, and what these buildings were uh, and what they are now kind of thing. Uh, and I think that, and it pulled in people from the suburbs. It was from the histor historical perspective, but still it got them there. And some of them had already lived there before, before the, they, you know, the flight to the suburbs occurred. So things like, is that something that that's, uh, can lead to what you're talking about, those kinds of conversations? Absolutely. It's sort of yeah, it's walking a, people, taking them by the hand and walking them in a space and helping them experience it in a new way. So that the stigma, just, just the stigma is a, an illusion, right? The stigma mm -hmm. is not the reality of the place, which is always more complicated than the stigma. So anything that, where you take people by the hand and walk them through mm -hmm. the space and you say, and you talk about what's there, the history, helps to create the new and, and the possible. So it becomes exciting. Right. And also sometimes um, when there are uh, citywide events, well, actually region-wide events, like uh, uh, we have in this area, the Tulip Festival, which brings everybody together for at least once <laughs> in the year to uh, focus around the tulips. But there are a lot of other things going on there. You know, we talk about the history of uh, Blacks involved in the city, and it, it brings all these different vendors in and, you know, there's music and there's conversation. So that is another way if we, if we focus more on, you know, trying to have those kinds of discussions that might also do it. Yeah, how, how, important, how important are those, um, those, those meetings, those, those, those happenings, um, those times when, when different communities uh, come together to, to building um, harmony, understanding, democracy, uh, functioning society. How, how, how critical are, are those, those events and festivals and, uh, that bring people into urban areas? Well, thinking about main streets, main streets are an amalgam of the, of the civic, the commercial, and the social and they're centered around public space. So the, the thinking about the public space is often neglected. When people are saying they're gonna make a Main Street plan, they're really thinking about encouraging the businesses. You know, they wanna do stuff like they want businesses to have cuter windows or, or better facades or something like that. But, but it, Main Streets are not simply commercial. And even when the commercial is under a lot of pressure as it is now, the main street can flourish because it's more than, than the commercial. And so ways to think about the public space, at all possibilities, I think, are essential. So people thinking about outdoor dining, like closing streets mm. the outdoor dining, or to make play streets, or to have festivals, all of these things help us move into the public space and be together and support, they support the life of the city. The, it's the life of the city that makes the city possible. So the citizens have to come together and, and rub shoulders. So festivals are an incredible part of that. When I was in Berlin a, a few years ago, um, 
in the fall, late fall, I got to go to the Christmas market. One of the Christmas mm. markets. Oh, I got to go to two Christmas markets. One was sort of a small Christmas market, and then there was the main Christmas market. I mean, as everybody was there, all kinds of vendors, all kinds of stuff going on. I had such a good time. And it just strikes me that kind of like pop up thing, festival takes us into the public space. We rub shoulders with people we wouldn't ordinarily see. Very satisfying on a, on a deep level. And it reminds us why we like the city. It's very urban. Any, any thoughts on that, Robert? Yeah, I'm thinking about a ceremony in 2018 in the city of Nantes in France. And once again, this was a place that our urbanist colleagues have often used as a base for a variety of different programs and projects. But one of the things about French urbanism is that it's not just about the serious nature of uh, making a city better by doing this project or that project. There's a view of space as a place where people should celebrate, where part of how you recreate the links that unite us, make us true members of a community, make us citizens of a city, is when we celebrate together. So it's not just the beauty of the place, it's the way in which we appropriate that space to do important civic-minded things that bring us together, often with diverse communities coming together at once, having celebrations that allow us to see what it is we have in common, because that is the root word in community, and then making sure that the space accommodates those kinds of arrangements, accommodates those kinds of interactions, so that folk are not only aware of themselves and how they're interacting with others, they're also aware of how they're using the space to create those opportunities to be in the presence of their neighbors. Main streets that allow that, that allow people to come together, that are festive, that are inviting because you have a good time there, you don't just do business, you don't just work there, it makes it very clear that the life of the city is more than the business. It is more than making money. If it's about the people, then it has to be about the people as social beings who will use the built environment to encourage and enhance the nature of the time that they spend together. And I loved what they do in Nantes because it is quite a beautiful city. It has a big castle. It is uh, one of those places that has a waterway that leads it to the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, it's, it's the kind of place where it's easy to have a good time. And without much effort at all, you can throw a party and everybody's going to have a ball. Cities are at their best when they make those kinds of comings together really possible. Did you, did you uh, have or have you had an opportunity to look at a, a as I listen to you talk, I'm, my thoughts are going towards Burlington, Vermont. I don't know if you're familiar with Ver Burlington, Vermont, but uh, what they've done is uh, made uh, the central, these, these two, they took these two uh, main streets, removed cars, and put all of these uh, restaurants and businesses uh, on that street. And that's where everybody goes. Uh, and when you think about Vermont, we always thought that there are no people of color in Vermont. I mean, when I grew up in the North Country, uh, I think there was something like 46 uh, African Americans in Vermont. <laughs> so we always thought of it as being, you know, not not some not a place where blacks would come. But uh, now Vermont, because they changed the pattern of the the inner city in such a way that you have to go there for just about everything. And it brings in um, it it brings in the people of color, and it's amazing transformation. And I always think about it because I when I look at Albany, I said, "Wow, something like this would uh, really benefit us." Um, when you have a, a a central place where everybody thinks they have to be. <laughs> um, you know, it's uh, cities do copy each other. So it's good, you know, it's fun to go to cities and say, oh, I really like what they've done. Uh, one thing about, about thinking that what you need is a central place that everybody has to go to, it can lead you down a rabbit hole. And certainly the, the state office buildings, mm -hmm. which carved out a huge neighborhood and right. from the city, they thought they needed a central place that everybody has to go to. And, you know, everybody does have to go there. Uh, but what a mess, right? Mm -hmm. So 
groups. So one has to be very careful. You have to go see a bunch of cities that did uh, various things to attract mm -hmm. people and see how it worked out. Charlottesville in Virginia, for example, mm -hmm. uh, made the main street into a pedestrian street. They had a fantastic architecture team that did that. They really knew what they were doing with public space. But a lot of other cities have made pedestrian streets, main streets that became pedestrian streets that, you know, just tragic. Old Town, which is in Baltimore, which is in a black community, was made into a pedestrian street and it just killed it. So, so I think that one of the things that we're trying to contribute on, through the, the work on Main Street is, is this idea that there's a, there's a box of Main Street, which is what everybody thinks about. But there's also the circle of the embedding urban space. Mm -hmm. And that has to be densely inhabited. Can't be empty. And then there's, there's the line, the, which is the street itself. And then there's the fact that there's the tangle, the tangle of all the streets in the whole region. And there are lots of these Main Street boxes dotted on the tangle. And that your concern is not with one. Albany's much, much bigger, much different city from Burlington, Vermont. So it rightly has a lot of main streets. And the concern is how does each of them can make a beautiful necklace, so yeah. a beautiful net. If they're not all strong, won't have a strong city. Mm -hmm. So one doesn't wish to centralize a, a, a big and important city like Albany. You, you want to have a, a lot of these places of gathering that are, are lively and delightful. Mm -hmm. And you want everybody to feel like they can go to any one of them and have a good time. So you don't mm -hmm. want segregation. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so sort of like looking around, like in the United States, we haven't accomplished this. If you look around the tangle, you'll find a functioning main street and then a bunch of ones that have been left to rot. Right. So, and that's the real crisis of our of our society that we've left a lot of places to rot. Rural communities, small rural communities where the bus, even the Greyhound bus doesn't go anymore, train doesn't go. So that's, you can't have a functioning society and leave big chunks of it in despair. And Mindy, you, you brought up our, our big state office complex, the Empire State Plaza, which, which erased a, a vibrant neighborhood um, and, uh, it, it, it's sometimes, uh, you know, a, a desert, you know, at, at certain times of the day, it concentrates a commuter population to some degree in, you know, in, in, in a very kind of tight area where they're not wandering, you know, in, into the rest of the city. Is, is it important to reclaim that space in some way? Um, can it be done? Uh, is, is it worthwhile? And how would, how would you advise us to do something like that? And, and, and Robert, I, direct that to you as well. You know, um, Americans are, so, I mean, we're not very subtle about how to make our cities. So we, we don't have the kind of skill that the French have over centuries of really thinking about cities and trying to make a city as beautiful as Rome. Like they really had the idea, let's make a beautiful city. And, but there was a lot of depth to their understanding of what that meant. And they made many beautiful cities throughout the country. In, in the U.S., we're, we're sort of, well, first of all, we're racist, which is what you're talking about. So we do terrible things to minority communities and to poor communities and to working class communities and to rural communities. So there's all kinds of communities that we just trash because that's how we are. And then we're brutal. So the state office complex is brutal, right? But that doesn't mean that the answer is to be brutal back. It's not an eye for an eye. In, in terms of the city. You, you want to be gentle with the city. It's, it's an ecosystem. You can't move quickly or viciously. Uh, but there, that doesn't mean that there aren't a hundred things that you could do with that space that would start to make it more diverse, bring people at different times of the day and night. Um, so we, um, it's that, it's that sort of, how do we start to look at our problems with imagination, with tenderness, with inclusiveness, and with tolerance, that Albany might have to tolerate the state office complex. But that doesn't mean it has to be as bad as it is now. Could be well, more- I'm, yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay, Bob? 
Now, I was just going to say, yeah, that uh, I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, at its apogee, at its peak, it had about 400,000 people living there. It had always been concerned in the 1950s with the sudden influx of African Americans post World War II. There was real concern that things could be done to keep that population of undesirables out. Newark now has about 220,000 people. It has lost a substantial portion of its white population. It has been trying since the 1960s to get that population back. And because it has always been concerned with its image that somehow or another it had become a majority black city, that so much of what it tried to do to revitalize it was to ignore that black population and pretend to the rest of the world, hey, we've got a hockey team. We've got a really excellent performing arts center. And as a consequence, although built environment solutions were put in there, it has never been able to attract a diverse population of the type that lived there in the 1940s and early 1950s. And I think Albany is in the same sort of situation, having cleaned out an area to make uh, an office building that I used to frequent all the time because of my work with the New York State Department of Health. It has definitely succeeded in creating something that is absolutely functional. But on the other hand, it has created something that nobody wants to live in and nobody wants to stay in. And one worries again, as Dr. Green has pointed out, about the stigma that's attached to it. One wants to believe that when one defines the problem of the city as having the wrong people there, it will always engage in activities that are going to be destructive and that in the end, in a democracy, are going to be a disaster. They're not going to work. Because if we all are supposed to live together, as Mindy has pointed out in Main Street, it's the job of the city to make that possible. Not to get rid of folk, but to figure out how to be inclusive. Cities are best when all of the folk who live there are contributing to the life, not just the economy, but the, but the social elements of the city that are so important for the raising of children, for the education of kids. Um, I, I keep thinking that Albany solved one problem and in the process created another. And I think when Mindy talks about the history of the American city, that's what has been so much a part of what we've done post-World War II, when we tried to move folk around in hopes that moving them from one place to another or getting rid of them altogether, things will suddenly improve. Uh, the people that you don't like are not cancers. The way to deal with the issues that they're facing isn't to excise them, it's to figure out how do you use the strength of the city to create solution, solutions so that everybody who's there not only has an opportunity to live there, they have an opportunity to thrive. I think that's still the challenge. And one hopes that folk who are trying to do organizing in, uh, in Albany are really fixed on the notion that it's about making this available for all of us, not just for the folk who work there because of uh, the fact that it's the capital of a, of, a, of a major state in the United States. Well, I would certainly hope that your book um, would at least get us thinking about uh, Main Street because we don't think that they are that important <laughs> in the sense of, you know, bringing people together and creating a vibrant community. Um, and I'm just wondering, how do you start that kind of conversation? I mean, I can see the book uh, helping with that. Uh, but I, I, I never thought about how to actually begin that kind of conversation where everybody's involved in it and seeing the what the city could be, how it could be different if we paid attention to those main streets. In, at the University of Orange, the uh, leaders have decided, because we are very concerned about Main Street in Orange, which the city has proposed an a urban renewal plan that we think is very dangerous. So we're trying to, you know, work with people in, this, in the city to slow that down and not let it tear apart the city in the way it's poised to. Um, so we're doing a reading group, a, a four-week reading group, and inviting people from the whole of Essex County to participate with us. And as part of that, we'll be doing walks, uh, but long walks, like eight miles. Uh, I think one of the walks is going to start in Maplewood, New Jersey, and then it's going to go all the way to Montclair, New Jersey, and end at a party that some people in Montclair are having, which is going to be a, a feast foraged from people's gardens. So sort of a fall harvest festival. So that'd be an eight mile walk. 
I don't intend to go on it myself. <laughs> uh, but, but that'll be great because Essex County, as I talked about in the book, has, is, has this tangle of really abandoned main streets and, and really prosperous main streets. But the county is not strong. So how do you, people have to see this. They have to walk and see how we've managed the space. So that, that's one way to get started. Yeah, that sounds, that sounds like that. Oh, I, I just want to- okay, you're most welcome. It's going to be on Zoom. You're most welcome to come to the University of Orange Book Group. Ah. Give you some ideas for what you'd like to do in Albany. Yeah, that sounds so, terrific. October 19th. It, it might also help us with this new, uh, I, I think the Urban uh, Institute just released, a, I guess, uh, I think they released it maybe a few years ago, but they re-released re it, uh, a study that showed that Albany ranked uh, 232nd out of 274 uh, overall inclusion-based, uh, uh, inclusion based on, I think, it's economics and race. And I don't know if the it's, it just came out, so the community hasn't really had a chance to digest it, but I'm just thinking that, um, you know, with focusing on, I like this idea of, of uh, getting in there and, uh, you know, having those kinds of discussions, the groups that you're talking about, as well as the walks, uh, might help us also in looking at how do we deal with what they're now saying is that we really haven't uh, included you know, so much of a part of our community. And we have to start looking at that and, and seeing what can be done. Looking at the, the, all the dispersal of main streets in the Tangle is a very good way of assessing your, the state of inclusion in your city. So it's, a, it's a small but perfect measure. We're, we're coming, coming to the end of time. I, I want to remind our viewers that the book is Main Street how a city's heart connects us all and you can buy it here on this screen from the book house of Stuyvesant Plaza. I encourage you to do that. I'd like to finish up with one uh, question relevant to the moment. Um, COVID seems to put our, uh, our main streets in danger in, 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 so, in so many ways. And I wondered whether you could share some advice for us um, how to keep our, our main streets uh, alive for all of our communities um, in, in Albany, Schenectady, and Troy during these very challenging times. Our, our main streets are in trouble because we're in trouble. And we're in trouble on many fronts. We're in a moment of converging crises. And the marker that Albany is not an inclusive city it should raise everybody's concern. And COVID is just another warning signal that the way we're living is sad and we have to change. So, uh, so the, the, you know that everybody knows that joke about the guy who, who dies during a storm and he gets to heaven and he says to God, why didn't you rescue me? God said, what are you talking about? I sent a policeman who knocked on your door. You said, no. I sent a, a boat. You said, no. I sent a helicopter. You said, no. What did I have to do to get your attention? And um, so what, is, what, is, <laughs> what does the universe have to do to get our attention? You know, the, mm -hmm. the ocean is having heat waves. The people are having heat waves. The hurricanes are coming. COVID is coming. What does the universe have to do to get our attention that we're in trouble? So. Um, so, simple thing, go for a walk, and you can be socially distanced, and it's very appropriate to see, see what's going on in your city. You have a fabulous, beautiful city, and, uh, you know, embrace it, make it better. But try to be thinking, we're in a moment of converging crises, we have to do this together. There's no one of us, there's no one group that can do it, we, we have to come together. And where do we come together? We come together on Main Street, so it's a good place to start to build a, a sustainable and just future. And let me just say that for me, what's really critical is I teach. I teach in a lot of places. I'm using this textbook because I'm very clear that there will be no return to the life that we knew in January, 2020. Mm -hmm. So if we all are about rebuilding cities, you may know that New York is losing 
through middle class and white flight, a whole bunch of folk who suddenly discovered, I don't have to go in the office, I can work from home. Ah. Exactly. What's, what's the plan to rebuild the city? How do we revitalize it? I believe that COVID-19 is something that was clearly taking advantage of the spaces that are so characteristic of urban centers has meant that we have to rethink what it is we want those urban centers to do. I think Mindy's most important contribution is to make that a public health issue, not a design issue, not an architectural issue, not an urban planning issue, but it's public health. And what could be a better way of illustrating the connection than to have a pandemic that takes advantages of all the, the bad things we do in cities, like, for example, pack people into segregated neighborhoods where they live in housing that's overcrowded so that the conditions of their work and the conditions of their life make this pandemic especially powerful. Will keep us in the body, uh, will probably keep uh, its presence in human populations for at least another two years. It's not going away fast. This is me speaking after having talked to a bunch of epidemiologists about it. So if we've got to redesign the way in which we use space, and redesign ways in which we think about space in the city, Main Street is a perfect way of getting people thinking about it. Well, what would work best? What are the ingredients I have to use? And the idea is that like any set of instructions, it's on the user, it's on the reader to figure out, okay, I've got a set of principles, what do I do next? And as a tool, since I'm speaking to folk who are connected to a university that can really help us with teaching some of this stuff, I think you'll find that the book, because it's so accessible, is exactly the kind of thing you want to give to students who are tired of dense text and want to have something that is as entertaining as it is informative. And, you know, I'm very pleased so far with how my students are smiling as they read it. That's a good yeah, well, that's, that's really good to hear. And we're in a redesign mode uh, now as a result of COVID and uh, people starting to understand systemic racism. Um, we're redesigning our police departments, you know, and other institutions. So now would be a perfect time to think about how we redesign, redesign the space. And Mindy's other book, From Enforcers to Guardians, A Public Health Primer on Ending Police Violence, oh. is, available, is available on Win, Mindy's um, website, bluechop.org, for free. Johns Hopkins Press, widely reviewed in a number of public health journals. Since you put those two together, COVID-19, the design of city and the cops, mm -hmm. think of them as a combined reading exercise oh. that really advance your notions about what to do next. Okay, I'm definitely going to check that out. <laughs> thank you. you. Have to thank you, Mindy. For free. For free. <laughs> it's for free. The big thing is for free. 256 page book, it is free. Oh, wow. it. Great ideas. Okay, thank you so much. Mindy Fully Love, Robert Fully Love, Alice Green, thank you so much for joining us. And, uh, and thank you for your wonderful new book and your other books, Mindy. And uh, thank you, audience, for tuning in. Bye. <laughs>